to talk about stuff that is so difficult for me to access because it's bringing up a lot of memories. But the reason I'm going to do it is because I need to remind you, light that fire again, understand how incredibly powerful you guys are. often we lose that passion and it's actually just not there and without the passion we don't connect to ourselves so Nick is here today to actually bring a bit of a vibe uh, into Waverly and a think bit of me of like caffeine a, a lot, yeah okay a bit of a natural <laughs> caffeine yeah. fix um, so I hope you guys enjoy him thank you how you doing guys yeah thank you Woo! <laughs> yeah ah, mm. All, all, you, all you guys have to say at the end of it is Mshlolo. Okay, all right. So, guys, my name is Nick Ingle. I run a gym, a couple of gyms called Emmet. We're actually up the road. The cool thing is we're actually doing training uh, for the kids at Highlands North. And we've been doing that for a couple of months now. It's going really well. We're looking, hopefully, at bringing that program into your school. Guys, what I wanted to talk to you about, I, I don't think there are many jobs that are tougher than those of a teacher. Uh, who, who thinks what they do is easy? Can, I, can, can you just raise your hand? What you do is easy, that's one. All right, okay, cool. All right, guys, I'm recording this. I'm gonna put this up on our YouTube channel for anyone that's not here, and if you wanna go back and reference it. All right, so guys, I'm gonna share a little bit of my... <laughs> My life story with you guys, I ha I've had quite a, a challenging childhood and um, I just want to talk to you about the value that I got from my teachers and to remind you guys of how important what you actually do is. And just to think like, who, who's been here the longest, if I may ask? Who's been here? Okay, perfect, right, okay. Hi. <laughs> so, do you sort of remember the reason, your why, when you started? Okay. Okay. I used to, I lived in Park Hurst and I used to drive Park Bradley every morning and I thought if only I taught at that school I would be at work already. I yeah. Be <laughs> <laughs> Best reasons. Wow. Okay, that's amazing. Okay, very, very cool. Yeah, the, the teaching's an amazing thing, guys, because you can affect people's lives. And I'm going to share my childhood with you. And what I'm going to tell you right now, so I went to Camps Bay High. I actually went Camps Bay Preschool, Camps Bay Primary School, and Camps Bay High School. And the only safety and security and stability that I had in my life, I got from my teachers at school. Uh, remember Terry De Jong, the guidance counselor? Actually, my hair stands up on end because... I'm going to talk about stuff that's very deep and very personal. And I'm going to go to some pretty dark places and share some very tough stuff with you guys. And the reason I'm going to do that is because you guys actually deserve to hear that. You know, it's an interesting thing. The leading cause of death, I, I was listening to a podcast yesterday, the new, the new leading cause of death in America for people under the age of 50, what would you guys say it is? Obesity? Stress? Opioids? You mean it's suicide? Depression? That's what's happening. And one of the things that hit me when I was listening to this is, what is the hardest part of depression? How do we prove depression to ourselves? We believe that no one cares. Does that make sense, guys? No one cares. So I'm a complete stranger. I've only met a few of you guys. I'm telling you that I care about you guys on such a deep level. How crazy is this? That I'm going to talk about stuff that is so difficult for me to access because it's bringing up a lot of memories. But the reason I'm going to do it is because I need to remind you light that fire again understand how incredibly powerful you guys are how amazing you are and the difference that you can actually make 
Because what happens is the communities that this school services, I know is the same as Highlands North. And I know the challenges that the, the kids go through. So my life started out, I was adopted. Um, I've gone through a lot of therapy in my life and we sort of got to an understanding that my brain doesn't function like normal people's brains. I'm sure most of you have already thought of that yourselves. So, <laughs> having just seen me for 10 minutes. You know, it makes perfect sense. So I was born three months premature. And what we suspect is, and I was adopted, my mother was unwed. Uh, what we suspect is that my, my mother, my biological mother, tried to abort me when she was six months pregnant with me and I survived. So, because I know that I spent the f large portion of my life in an incubator, and so my life started off with my mom trying to kill me. Okay, so that was, yeah, th that's how it started. Unfortunately, the lady, the, the, the lady that adopted me, my adopted mother, was a drug addict. And she put me in certain positions that was very challenging. She, my, she was married to a gentleman who I call my dad. And he is my dad. I love him. He's like my best mate. Um, I'm very grateful to still have him in my life. And uh, he nags me, gives me a hard time. So I know he loves me. You know, when our parents nag us and tell us what to do, that's when it's fine. Huh? Absolutely. So my mom divorced my father and she remarried. We moved to Natal. My dad was not able to have a lot to do with us uh, because of the divorce agreement in those days, like two weeks um, access. The person my mother remarried was a nice guy by the name of Errol, but he also had a drug issue. And we lived uh, in Natal. Is anyone here from Natal, Hillcrest, Valley of a Thousand Hills? Okay. Beautiful part of the country, huh? Like a urbanist level expert. And it just, it's like amazing place to grow up as a child. Incredible childhood. We were on a farm, horses, ducks, well, you know, forest, it was beautiful. And one day I was uh, playing upstairs on the stairs below his office, which was upstairs. My mom was out of, uh, she was in town and there was a bang, a loud bang. And I looked up and my stepfather was gone. And there was this thing left in his place. He had blown his head off with a rifle. So from here was gone. And I don't know how long I was left alone with the body for. But when they found me, they couldn't pull me off the stairs. I was holding on so tight. And still to this, right now I'm feeling it in my back. Um, I still have a terrible fear of heights because I feel like I'm falling. And my mom unfortunately disappeared. She couldn't handle it. My grandparents came down to look, uh, to look after me. And um, my mom disappeared. I, I suspect she went into an institution. She wasn't a bad person, but unfortunately the drugs started to affect her judgment and her ability to do what a parent should do. What's the job of a parent? To nurture, protect, keep safe, stability, safety. Which is interesting enough exactly what you guys do. It's what you guys give your kids. Safety, security, nurturing, love, attention. It's the most beautiful thing about your profession. That's the nobility of your profession. So... We, my mom came back eventually and I moved to Cape Town with my mother and unfortunately the drug use got worse. And my mom was gay and she, all of her friends were in the gay community. And for whatever reason, I still don't know because unfortunately my mother killed herself when I was 16. She started to send me off to her gay male <coughs> friends. <coughs> And these guys would keep me for the evening or for the weekend and abuse me and rape me. It started with two guys at a time and it escalated. She then used to start to send me off to her drug dealers. 
And these memories, guys, have taken me years and years and years of hard work to get to. The, the difficulty of a child at the age of six to be standing in an apartment locked in a bedroom with two grown men in a bed and you're looking out of a window and you're wondering what you did that was so bad, that was so evil as a six-year-old boy that your mother would send you there. And it's then that I gave up on the world, guys. I quit. I gave up trusting people. I gave up believing people. And the problem is I gave up on myself. So I started to do what any child would do. What do we want as kids, guys? We want to be loved by our parents. We want to be kept safe by our parents, right? Yeah. So I started to go voluntarily. And, she, and it ended up, my, one, my last memory is of 10 guys at once in a room. In a house in the Cape Flats. And I remember stump, they, they, they started to drug me. I remember stumbling down this passage as a child. Trying to get someone to help me. And there was an old lady, an elderly lady sitting in the kitchen just looking at me. And they came and picked me up from behind. And still to this day, I hate being picked up and taking me back into the bedroom. I started to go voluntarily for two reasons. And this is the hardest thing that I've got to deal with. One, I, want, I thought if I could get my mother to love me, she would stop sending me. And two, because they would drug me, it was a chance for me to get out of my head. At that age, I started to identify drugs as a way of not to feel. And I started, I just found alcohol at a family function when I was nine years old, and I started drinking. I drank up until the age of 36, when I got called into a meeting at work, and they asked me, do I have a drinking problem? And I said, yes, I have a drinking problem. Because I knew at that moment, if I would have said no, Guys, I was drinking 20 drafts a day. Sure. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know the keg and beagle in Linksfield at the Linksfield Terrace Shopping Center down the road here on the way to Edenvale? That was my local. 20 drafts a day. I was about 50 kilos heavier and I was slowly killing myself. And I knew that if I didn't say yes, I would have been fired and I probably would have only had six months left I would have killed myself I would have killed myself in an accident will shot myself or drunk myself to death guys I believe I've got a pretty good relationship with God it's an amazing thing you know you, you can talk to him you can connect you feel the love you do stuff Sure. Whew. The hardest thing for me to talk about is that my life got to a point where it was so bad because I didn't understand, I didn't have the skills that I would sit at home on my couch with my gun in my mouth and I'd ask God to give me the courage to kill myself. You know that, that feels when you believe and you have a connection to God and you love Him. And at the same time, I was praying that he would help me get through this because I didn't want to die, but I didn't know how to stop. That's what I grew up with. And one of the pillars that I had to get through what I did was those moments from my teachers. The little bit of care, the little bit of concern, the little bit of connection, the little bit of stability. Because I'd come home and I didn't know if my mother would be home. I didn't know if she would be conscious. I didn't know if she would be beating, you know, the belt. There would be absolute chaos. And my mom was not a bad person. It's unfortunate that long-term drug use changed her and changed who she was. 
You know, there was always food. The house was always clean. All of these nice things, but there was never stability. And the only stability that I got was from my friends. So I'd spend, it's quite funny, all of my friends, their parents were married and they had happy homes. It's from my friends and from my teachers. And that's why I realize actually only now talking to you guys that I always volunteered for a lot of stuff. Don't laugh at me, I was a librarian. <laughs> I was chairman of the Photographic Society. I was involved in the school plays. All of these things, and I realize why now. Because that's why I love doing these talks. So I get these memories and this understanding about myself. And these gifts. Because it's taken me, I, I do, I've done hundreds of these talks. And that's the only way that I can talk. Like, I, I stayed at school because I felt safe. I stayed at school as long as possible because I stayed safe. So I think sometimes when you guys get caught up, so I know for myself, we get caught up in the day to day, running our lives, trying to pay bills, dealing with stress, dealing with traffic, dealing with the, the flow uh, within a company, you know, from the top down. And you guys have got it tough, you know. But the value that you have in those interactions with kids, because I know that there are girls that are going through exactly what I went through and worse. But the value that you have, the power that you have, the ability to connect and to change your life. I'm quite sure, guys, that the reason I didn't pull that trigger is because something inside of me knew that you could trust people knew that you could rely on people knew that you could have faith in someone and that someone would treat you with kindness for no, no reason other than to be kind to you not that they all they would want anything from you and that's what you guys do every single day with these kids that come through that's how powerful you are that's how incredible you are and unfortunately, sometimes we forget that. You know, it's like driving in a car where the windscreen wipers stop working and the road's kicking up dirt. That windscreen's getting foggier and foggier and dirtier and dirtier. I'm here to wipe down that windscreen, to clean that windscreen off, to ask you, when you started this, what were those reasons? Don't forget. You know, it's funny. People think politicians are powerful. They think the army's powerful. Doctors are powerful. No teachers because you guys hold the future of this country in your hands you guys you don't know who's going to cure cancer going to be president or just going to be a good mom hey that's the power that you guys have and that's the power that you carry and that also is the responsibility it's a big thing that's why i'm so happy to be here and to be able to share with you that's what I just wanted to bring through, just to remind you guys. You know, in life, I think most people are only happy for 15 days a year. You know, what, why is that? Why 15 days a year? How much leave do you get? Most people. 15 days. Huh? That's a crazy. So I don't want you guys to just be happy for 15 days a year. You be happy every day, every single day, because when you're walking out, you're changing lives. You're not changing lives for kids that are upset because they didn't get the latest whatever, or their parent took them off the computer because they were playing. You're getting kids that are coming to school with very little or nothing at home in terms of support and love and connection. And you guys carry that power. And that's what's awesome. That's why I want happiness every single day, not just for 15 days a year. Guys, one of the things that I like to do with my talks, and I know I've got about 45 minutes, is to do a, a question and answer. Uh, because I think for me, I've been sober, well, October will be 13 years, October 21st. And I've been insolvent, uh, once in my sobriety, got wiped out financially, I've been homeless twice, I've been divorced, and I've got through all of this because of a belief and a drive, because I knew that there was a purpose in my life. 
And I've realized that my purpose is here, it's standing and talking to you guys. You know? And I understand we all have to earn a living and I'm very grateful that I have a business that can afford me the opportunity to do this. But I'm not rich financially, but I'm richer than anyone else I know because I can come and share with you guys. And just to remind you of what you do, those lives that you can affect. Someone once told me like the most important thing that you can do is smile at someone because you don't know what that's going to do for their day. Huh? Just smile. That's it. Hey, how you doing? You know? And that's the beauty of it. So, you know, what, what my life has now afforded me the opportunity to do is I have a gym. We do a lot of training at corporates. And I've been able to set up a development academy where we train young athletes from disadvantaged schools. One of the things, guys, that I hate because I was bullied terribly at school. Because I didn't know how to relate to people. I didn't know how to interact with people. I, I, was, I was broken and I was taken advantage of. But by guys that were also having problems. One of the guys who gave me the hardest time at school was a friend of mine, Paul. We were great friends in primary school and he was really mean to me in high school. And he phoned me about five years ago crying to apologize. And he also confided in me that he was being abused. So that's how he acted out. But I hate bullying. One of the things in my life that I hate as well is financial bullying, circumstance bullying. So what I mean by that is a kid who's growing up in Alex or in Bertram's in Bears Valley that has the desire, the drive, the ethics, will give anything to succeed, doesn't have the opportunity. So I started training the rugby boys at Queen's High School. Six of them got scholarships to go to Parktown Boys, including Rez, which was probably the most important thing because it meant they got fed every day. I now have five amazing coaches from Queens. We support a couple of the rugby guys that are now in university at UJ and are probably playing rugby for the Lions. I'm, I'm a province supporter. It's very tough for me <laughs> to deal with. Okay, Paki, you're going to the Lions. All right. Uh, no, they're, they're still <laughs> province. Okay. So, you know, we, we, and these guys are now training the kids at Highlands North boys we want to come and train the girls here at no cost for free because we want to bring the the the, the self-esteem and the development of your self-worth and self-esteem that you can get from the exercise is an amazing thing we want to give that to kids so i'm coming guys from a play and like i've created five jobs now my guys are at corporates there are 23,000 schools in south africa 10,000 of which i understand are sort of like they would call functioning. I want to put three coaches into every single school. 75,000 coaches. So, and what's scary is I can do that because I've started doing it. And when you come from a place of such darkness, you understand the value of light. And all of these amazing things that I'm going to do and my coaches are going to do and our team is going to do is because I found a little bit of safety, a little bit of stability, a little bit of care in my teachers at school, in you guys. So guys, if you have any questions, I will answer anything 100% honestly. Just wanted to come and remind you that it doesn't matter where you come from and what you've been through, speaking now as one of your students, that just with a little bit of care and love and concern, you can achieve great things. That's right, we've run self-defense workshops in townships for schoolgirls, no cost. During the xenophobic attacks, I went through to town and I did a self-defense workshop at one of the churches there. 3,000 people. I bumped into one of the guys the following week in Santin. He was crying that someone had taken the time to come and show support to his community. We can do amazing things with our lives if we don't pull that trigger. If we don't put a gun in our mouth and blow our heads off. And I know there was a reason for me not doing that. And the teaching staff that I had, the support, was part of that. And that's what you guys have. That's the value of what you guys do every single day. And you may not even realize it. So I just wanted to come and remind you guys that you're awesome. That you kick ass. That you are powerful. 
and that there's an incredible benefit. And the reality is you may not even know the effect that you have on someone's life, on the power that you have. So with that, any questions? Yes. No, it's like, no, you, man. I'm, just, I'm bullying you. Okay. Sorry for making you cry. That you. This is not a question. Okay. I know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. It, it, it's so true because it's like lives. You're changing lives. You're holding lives in your hands. And it's just with the small things. You know, I think the, the, the knowledge that you pass on is important but it's not as important as the stability and the safety you give to the lives that you're going to affect thank you for that appreciate that usually there's lots of questions i must have done a good job <laughs> guys okay is there if there's not i just really i wanted to say thank you i know oh yes we have a question the young gentleman in the back <laughs> yep you're welcome sir yep. Yep. The impression I get is that your mother was a very bad person. And maybe, you know, part of your own uh, mm. therapy, if I can put it that way, is to actually accept that your mother was a bad person. So, it, it, exactly what you're saying, I've been angry with her for many years. And what I've come to realize is, and it's a lesson, oddly enough, that my divorce taught me. It's the understanding other people's stuff. I don't I, I don't believe that my mother was inherently evil. She did very evil things. But she was firstly, she was not. My mom tried to kill herself for the first time when she was 14. She was not a well person. And unfortunately, she was able to cope enough in society to get married. I mean, she married my dad when she was 17, and he was 27. It was the 60s, guys. It was fine. Okay. <laughs> so I think it just, she started to self medicate. Um, at the time also people there was not an understanding of bipolar they were the very moody and a lot of prescription medication marijuana it took me a long time to say to forgive my mom and say that she did bad things she wasn't a bad person and that that's a gift I gave myself it's actually no, so I don't have to carry that anger that anger and rage and resentment towards her yes sir then the other thing is Good. <laughs> but, uh, seeing as you had all those bad experiences in Cape Town, right, and you're now living here in Joburg. Yes. I think you must stop supporting problems and support the lion. Okay, done. <laughs> Sold. All right. Stay with the lions, Paki. Deal. <laughs> Good point, eh? Huh? Oh. Put that behind you. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'm going to insist he changes that blue and white shirt. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Rach. Thank you. Okay. I want to give you guys a round of applause. Not me. Um, for your honesty oh, yeah, okay. and your realness today. Um, and I think it is all about acceptance because if you accept yourself, you can accept all the learners in your class as well. Mm. And I think what, what Nick is really trying to transfer is how every small gesture, just a smile, just noticing a girl in the classroom, mm. is actually making her feel valuable and special, where she may not be getting that at home, where she may not have a mother or a father mm. who are emotionally present or even present at all. So you have no idea how much of a role model and what a strong mm -hmm. impression you really do make. You are attachment figures in the classroom and you've got to really bear that in mind. That's big. That's bigger than being an educator. That's more important than mm -hmm. teaching the syllabus. If you can create that safe environment, <coughs> that safety, then you can actually teach easily. The rest just should come really easily. Yeah. So thank you for being so thank honest you. and so real. That Only is like really difficult you. to do. Yeah. And we really appreciate your time and your energy here with us today. Thank you for having thank me. You. Thanks for staying, guys, after school. <laughs>